Now this Sunday is a little bit of a, a unique Sunday in that uh, a number of uh, the ladies from the church are at uh, a retreat, and I am so glad for the ladies who are here. We don't have just a masculine congregation, but I will warn you, a couple months ago I was sitting down, starting to figure out my plan for the year, and I didn't want to quite start our sermon series on the week that a number of our ladies were going to be gone. So I, I started thinking, well, well, what am I going to preach on this week? And came to my mind, you know what I should do? Is go through the stories of the Bible and what is the most masculine story in the Bible? And it actually didn't take me very long to come up with it, so just hang on with me. It's found in Judges chapter 3, at least in my opinion. This is kind of one of the most fun stories, I think, in the whole Bible. Uh, but just before we get to Judges chapter 3, uh, a few moments ago, Ron came up and he read a little piece out of the end of, of Romans chapter 7. And it's a passage I think is kind of related. Paul, as you go through all of his writings, emphasizes something over and over again. And that is, he's got different phrases for this, but I am the worst among all sinners. I am the blood. At least a big chunk of the New Testament. I am the worst among all sinners. And Romans 7 picks up on that idea that he's got struggles. He starts off the book of Romans saying, don't focus on other people's sin, otherwise you're going to be convicted of hypocrisy because each one of us, each one of us has struggles. Each one of us messes up. And then he goes on, he starts to talk about how Christ supernaturally transforms us. But then in Romans 7, he suddenly realizes he needs to address something. He's talking about the fact that Christ has done something remarkable in his life, and he needs to address the fact that sin stubbornly remains as part of his life. Jesus has changed me. But man, how come I keep messing up? How come I keep doing the things I know are wrong? How come the things that I know are right, I keep messing up and forgetting to do? And you get to the end of Romans 7, and it finishes with, but thanks be to God. And then he's going to launch into a discussion about the resurrection and how his life is there. He's talking about, we should all know our own sin, our own failures, not so that our self-worth is beat up. But because the more we understand the fact that I am a sinner, it drives me to be completely dependent on God, knowing that I cannot do it on my own. But a realization of how good God is and how much He must value me to love me despite the fact that I am a sinner. Which to me kind of leads us to a story of Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, people of God have just come into the land of Israel. And they're broken up into a whole lot of tribes. They start to look like the world around them. We need to understand that nations... Were really nations. They were, they were more like tribal confederacies. They were they were loose, um, these semi-nomadic people that are moving around, whether they be the Israelites or whether they be the enemy nations all around them. And sometimes certain tribes would rise up and become a little bit more powerful. And that's kind of what happens here. And when one tribe becomes big, it starts to look like a modern, I guess, police drama on TV. You ever seen an episode where it's, it's they're all concerned because there's uh, this small-time shopkeeper, and uh, some thugs come along and say, hey, you give us $1,000 a week, we'll make sure you're protected. And by protected, it means we're not going to come in and beat you up. Right? It's kind of a repeated theme in a lot of 
TV shows. Anyways, that's kind of how the book of Judges is. It's all these loose tribes and semi-nomadic people, and they're coming along and they're demanding tribute, and if you give us tribute, we'll protect you. And that means we won't be blown. And in the southeast corner of Israel, in a desert area, just around the Dead Sea, the smallest of the tribes of Israel, Benjamin, lives. And the people from across the Jordan River, the Moabites, have crossed over, <coughs> taken over the city of Jericho, and they've gone to the Benjamites, and then for years have said, you got to pay us this tribute money. And for years they did. That brings us to, to Judges chapter 3, verse 12. My remote works, and it's always a little iffy, it seems. You may just have to follow along with me. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel and they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Edwan, the king of Moab, 18 years. Edwan, okay, so think of this king. He is strengthened by God. You catch that. The enemy of the people of God is strengthened by God. Why is that happening? That, this is a theme that we find quite often in the Bible where God raises up an enemy to say, hey, you guys, you need to pay attention. You need to become people of repentance and people of dependence. He's an enemy of God, and God strengthens him. And often, enemies to the people of God rise up to call the church back to dependence. The church is called back. God doesn't raise up this enemy to say the nations need to repent. He rises and raises up this enemy so that the people of God learn to be people of repentance. Judges is a book Always, its main theme is calling the people back to commitment. The Moabites were uh, an ancient people. They were related to the people of Israel. They were the descendants of Lot, who was uh, a relative of Abraham. Um, they become uh, an important nation throughout the Old Testament. Back uh, just a little bit before this, and as Moses is bringing the, the people through towards the promised land, God speaks to them in the book of Deuteronomy. He says, don't touch these people. They're relatives of yours. Leave them alone. And as much as Israel's left them alone, Moab eventually becomes the stronger. And Eglon, he's an interesting character. We're told later on he's a, he's a bigger man. That's going to come up later in our text. Literally, it's he's a round man. Uh, it's often translated fat in our translations. He is somebody who's got a little bit to him, and that, in our era, is a negative self-image thing, right? But in their era, in a time in which people didn't eat very much, in a time in which you might eat meat on the odd special occasion, maybe once a quarter or a couple of times a year, to, to be large was a sign of wealth. It was also a sign of health. In a time when there's a lot of dysentery and all sorts of bugs and everything and everybody's always sick, this was a sign that you were healthy, wealthy, and powerful. And his name, this is, there's some humor, a lot of humor in this passage. This is not supposed to be one of those moments of humor. 
Ah, but his name literally means he's a small bowl. A small bowl. Now, generally, if you call anybody any name that has to do with a cow, and they're a little bit larger, that, that's kind of insulting. It's supposed to be humorous in our day and age, but in their day and age, this was not part of the humor. This guy was a calf, basically. It means he was a descendant of the gods who were really powerful, and they pictured in Moab their gods, their chief god as being a bull. And so this was a small bull. He came from the gods. He's somebody very powerful. And he takes over the city of Jericho, uh, a town with with a spring and date palms all around it and become a little bit of a prosperous center in the middle of the desert. Um, we know that at other times of history, in fact, just before this, when Joshua had gone by, it had city walls. It probably doesn't at this stage. It's not so much a big city. It's, it's more of a place where there was a couple of buildings. And then for the most part, People would come in and camp there for a little while, and then they'd move on to another place where there was water. So we've got this guy who's healthy, wealthy, powerful, he's a threat, and he's being raised up by God to teach the people a little bit of a lesson. Pick up the verse in 15 and can quit. I'll have you follow around for the rest of this. Somehow, somehow the tent doesn't always work. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjamite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute to by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length, and he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. Are you going over this? And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal. And I'm going to cut it off there. This is mid-sentence. Well, that's okay. We can cut it off mid-sentence. We're going to pick up the sentence in a minute. But the people start to cry out to God. And we have this here heroic figure who rise up, Ehud, who's part of the group, who has to bring tribute to the king. So what's he up to? His job is basically to go around to all the tents and say, hey, you need to give me your tribute, and I will take it to Moab. I will take it to the king. Who's the one who's appointed? to take the tribute to the king. It's somebody the king trusts. Somebody the king learns to rely on. He's, he's collecting tribute. Now, tribute, for the most part, is going to be things like you have to give every household to give a, a goat, uh, a little container of flour, um, something like that. However it works, enough that uh, the king of Moab is, is satisfied, so he's going around, and he's, he's collecting these items, and he takes them to Jericho. And the comedy is not so much about the fact that the king of Moab is, is as a Catholic. It's, it, it more comes in here. He's of the tribe of Benjamin. Who's Benjamin? He was several generations before this. Son of Jacob. Son of Rachel. These two important figures in early Israel's history. Jacob had a number of children. His favorite was Benjamin. His favorite was the last son that was born to him by his favorite wife. He had a bunch of them. We're not even going to go into that. 
But Jacob, as we go through his story, is kind of this scoundrel figure. He's a deceiver. He doesn't look strong. He's not a powerful figure. He's a nobody, and he's, he's, he's a weaselly kind of guy. He has a brother who's strong, powerful. Everybody likes Esau, his brother. But Esau never turns his heart to God. Jacob, eventually, God gets a hold of his heart. God does something supernatural in his life. And as a result, he changes. And when his final son is born, Rachel dies in childbirth. So most women died at that time. And she's dying in childbirth, and she cries out, name him ben Oni," which basically means son of my sorrows. And Jacob looks at the baby. You can't name a child that. So he changes the name to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand. Right hand being a symbol of strength. And God has so gotten a hold of his heart that this man who had been a weaselly deceptive person, now in his moment of sorrow and grief, finds strength in God. Now, did you catch the joke? Benjamin. His name means right hand. This becomes a theme throughout Benjamin's life. Now, we look at it and say, that doesn't sound that funny. But this is for the Hebrews. They thought this was hilarious. Humor's changed in time. Throughout the Old Testament, a little later in the book of Judges, um, Benjamin, the right-handed tribe is described as having 700 left-handed slingshot warriors who can break a hair at a distance. Their left hands, all of them, the right-handed tribe. Later, David starts to collect the soldiers from Benjamin, and he starts to describe all the soldiers from Benjamin. They're ambidextrous. They, they, they could use either hand. And, and they're supposed to be inspiring me here. We've got this right-handed tribe, and we've got these left-handed warriors. It becomes a theme throughout the whole Bible. He makes a sword, probably of, of bronze. Uh, the, we're moving in this era from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, if that means anything to you. But it's probably not quite there yet. They, they probably only have very soft metals. And he has made himself a sword. Now, we don't know the entire reason why he's made a sword. Um, the text, kind of as we read the flow of the story, makes it sound like he's going to kill the king from the beginning. We actually don't know that. Uh, he might have just done this for self-defense or something like this. It was an unusual sword. Usually swords... In this time, we've got some artwork that shows it, were kind of long, and they kind of had this sky-like curve to them, and uh, warriors would take them, and they would strap them to their chest or their back, and uh, that was kind of what a sword would look like in their day. So for him to make this knife-like sword was very unusual. He goes in with these people, and he brings the tribute to the king. Now, I've already said he's the tax collector. He's the guy who the king trusts. And a little bit later in the story, we're going to find out he asks the king for a private moment. Who gets a private moment with a king? Is it a stranger? Or is it somebody the king trusts? Ehud was somebody's trust. In fact, the way the story does it, he comes and says to the king, I have a secret to tell you that nobody else can hear. Who does that? It's a spy. Ehud, the guy who's about to become the hero in this story, he's rascal. He's a bad guy. He has been a traitor to his people. He goes and he takes the tribute with a few other people to the king. 
And they give it to the king, and they leave. And at the very end of the, the last line on the screen behind me, it says, turn back. In Hebrew, they do something in their language that does not work in English, but you can add a couple of letters to the beginning of a word to indicate that this is a, a verb that has sudden and emphatic and dramatic. And that's what happens here. He gets to a place called Gilgal, and he turns back dramatically. Why? Well, according to the verse, he turns back at the idols near Gilgal. Yeah, that's important. Bob. Gilgal had already been important in Israel's history. A couple generations before this, maybe only two generations, maybe three, Joshua had led the people of Israel to the Jordan River. It dramatically parts. They're able to walk across on dry land and they enter this, the nation of Israel for the first time at Gilgal. And Joshua says, okay, everybody, stop right now. We've got one thing we got to do. We're going to build a giant stone monument right here, right now, to commemorate what God has done. So that forever people will come here and see the dramatic thing God has done. Well, clearly, we know that monument survives for a period of time. But as well, the Moabites have built statues to foreign gods. Now, They would have made this, this, this sword. He didn't stab the king yet. He hadn't done anything. He had left. And I'm left to wonder, did he get to Gilgal and he looks at these stone idols? And over here he sees this monument to God. And God convicts him, you have a choice. You have a choice at this very moment. What are you going to do? Are you going to follow the God of Israel who has dramatically worked in the past or are you going to continue being this weasley traitor who goes around doing what's best for himself trying to get the king's favor trying to get rich yourself. Who are you going to follow? And he makes his choice. And he turns around. Who do you want to give you a follow along with me? Again, remembering this is mid-sentence. And said, this makes it almost sound like it happens instantaneously, but he's traveling. I have sent, I have a secret message for you, O King. And he commanded, silence! All his attendants went out from his presence. And Ahab come, came in, came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool room chamber. And Ahab said, I have a message from God for you. And he arose from the sea, and Ahab reached with his left hand, took his sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. This is a dramatic story. <laughs> then Ahud went out into the porch and closed the door of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the door of the roof chamber Locked. They thought, surely he's relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the door of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them. And there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Again, why does a king trust a foreigner alone? Because this guy is a spy. He hoops this traitor. He is a failure. He 
brings this message and the king yells out silence, everyone give me the room. They're in the upper part of the palace. They would have had a, a main part would be downstairs, but the roof of the palace would have been a place where they could go up and sit, maybe get a little bit of a breeze. There wouldn't be a full wall around it. There would have, however, been probably some shading over the top and some, some pillars in the corner to hold it up. There would have been an opportunity for, for air to move through, but there would have been some rooms around the side. I don't know if it would have been normal for Ahud to say, I've got a message from God. I kind of wonder if that one should have been a warning sign to the king. That this is more than just, well, by the way, so and so is trying to overthrow me. This is more than, oh, that tribe over there, that, that village, they're, they're trying to get out of their taxes. This is something different. I have a message from God. He's in Jericho. This tax collector is in Jericho. And God's clearly all over. And you may, you may think this sounds a little familiar. Go to the New Testament. Jericho is in the New Testament as well. And in the New Testament, uh, in, the, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus is going through the city of Jericho. And he looks up, and there's a guy in a tree. He's a short little guy. It's interesting that once again, his physical stature is brought out. It's meant to be, in that context, a little insulting that this is a guy who's too small to be a farmer and, and perhaps a little wheezy. And he's certainly how he lived because he also was a traitor for the foreign Romans. He was also a tax collector. And Jesus says, come down from the tree. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to spend some time with you. Oh. So we've got these two traitors. Isn't it remarkable how God can get hold of us? Even when we fail. Even when we struggle. Even when we do what we should know better. Ehud, read the dramatic story where he reaches down to his right thigh, he grabs the sword, he plunges it in. It, it doesn't happen instantaneously. Apparently, they sat down. I wonder if they talked for a minute. I kind of wonder if it took him a moment to get his nerves up to do this. But he does, he stabs it in to the king's belly. The, the king really just kind of overruns the sword, I guess. I read a, uh, I was reading this week as I was preparing for the sermon of a, of a scholar in the book of Judges who went and talked to an emergency room doctor about saying, could this have happened in such a way that they would have alerted uh, all his you know, staff and that? And the doctor said, if he stabbed it exactly right, there's a chance that uh, he could have lost consciousness in a little five seconds and would not have been able to, um, to call out for help. Now, normally, you stab somebody in the stomach, it's a slow death. This, however, if you do it just right, and this doctor said, two things will happen. You lose consciousness immediately, and your bowels will run loose. That's exactly how the Bible is described. The Bible makes it clear that he's dead instantly. And it adds this extra little detail just for fun of this. Clearly, this man was trusted by the king, but now he's dead. He bars the doors to downstairs, and he goes to one of the side rooms to a porch area. And uh, the way that this appears to be, now the king. Sorry. They don't go in because they think the king is going to the washroom. He probably, there, this sounds really bad, but there's probably almost like a two story outhouse system. And that's kind of how they did it in these days that the, this person who was powerful kind of got away from the smell a little bit. 
the best guess is maybe, how, what, what, how did he get out here? I mean, he locked the doors from upstairs. He probably climbed down. If he had jumped off a porch down where he could have hurt himself, um, people would have noticed, but he probably climbed down, went until it was safe, and just walked out. And he gets away. Finally, they, uh, as we read the story, the, the uh, attendants grow weary of waiting, figure something's happening, or again, it's a humor that kind of works in all cultures. The story's not quite done, that's, that's kind of the climax, but there's an end to it, and, and again, if you want to follow along, in verse 26, Ahud escaped while they delayed. And he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies the Moabites into your hand. So they went out after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow and he went to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land was cut at rest for 80 years. He passes by these idols and this monument that Joshua had risen again, and he goes to a land of Syria. We have no idea where that is. But he keeps going beyond that. And Benjamin was kind of at a low spot on the land. He starts climbing up. It's not a very long distance, but in the desert, he climbs up about 4,000 feet in elevation and looks over this plateau at the top that looks down into the valley where Benjamin lives. And they start to, to bring together all the warriors of the nation to attack the Moabites at this moment of disorder. Now, they would normally spend part of the year in Jericho, part of the year back in Moab, before they get a chance to get across the Jordan River again, they attack. Why? Because the Lord has acted. God did something supernatural, not just in Ahab's life. Because Ahab was this traitor who turned to somebody who would follow God. What does everybody else think of it? How easy would it have been to say, hey, I know I've been spying on you for years, but come follow me now as we attack the Moabites. Uh, trust me, we can win. Do you think the people would naturally have followed him? Probably not. But God is doing something supernatural in the whole group, and they follow very quickly, Ahab. He's now their leader. Follow me, for the Lord has acted. There's a little bit of time to organize, but things move quickly. Moab is subdued in battle. They cannot get back to their main base of operation, and there is a great win for this left. Conclusion as I think about this passage. This is not a call on us to assassinate bad people. But I do look at this passage and say it's so easy to be down on self. It is so easy to beat ourselves up for failures and easy to start thinking maybe God has no place in his kingdom for me. Know that when you hear that voice, it's from yourself from the enemy. The voice of God is the truth that there is a Savior. He came for hope. And the focus is not to be on self and sin and failure and frustration. The focus is on the power of an almighty God who acts. We will often sing maybe in church about the might of God 
But often as I talk to Christians, we start to treat God almost like somebody who gives me wishes. That if I pray something, maybe I'll grab my request. If it doesn't happen, I might start to act disappointed. And God is not here just to grab wishes. We pray to him, absolutely. God does supernatural, mighty things. But he's not here in our beck and call. The call here is to completely fall at his feet. To recognize him as the almighty king. The reality is not that God has to fall in line with me. The reality is I have to fall in line with him. To prayerfully, hopefully, consider at every moment all that he has done for me and focus on what he has already accomplished. And this story shows it is remarkable what God can do with those who are frustrated, those who fail deeply, those who struggle, and yet still make a choice that I will follow God. That when push comes to shove, he is the one I will obey. I want to take a moment and sing to this God. Thinking about this, it's about a great victory. So I made the suggestion to the worship team. Let's sing a song of great victory. And I'm going to invite them forward to lead us as we sing.